So in the human genome, there are 2,000 to 5,000 uh, protein coding genes that are annotated or predicted to bind RNA. And these RNA binding proteins can influence many, many aspects of RNA processing from splicing to export, translation, stability, and, and degradation. So today, I'll, I'll, we'll focus mainly on talking about uh, their, their potential roles in RNA splicing. In, in the human genome, the majority of, of genes are have introns, and these are uh, multi-exon genes where introns are spliced out. The spliceosome conduct majority of these activities by binding proximally to exons at the 5' splice site and the 3' splice site. And these proteins uh, then mediate the excision of introns and, again, the coming together of, of exons to form mature messenger RNAs. However, there are a subset of RNA binding proteins are splicing factors that can mediate this process by, uh, by either recruiting or preventing the spliceosomal machinery to come to uh, exons to modulate their use. And so the alternative use of these exons within a final mature messenger RNA generate different mRNA isoforms that could be translated into different protein products. One of the big questions we have is that of this group of 2,000 to 5,000 predicted RNA binding proteins, uh, what fraction of them can control different molecular functions in a cell? But for the majority of these predicted RNA binding proteins, they have not yet been annotated to have uh, any actually molecular function. Thanks, Jean, for the introduction. So the new piece of technology that we developed that really enabled the rest of the project are these new splicing reporters. And a splicing reporter is a synthetic gene that contains a mini gene or the simplest possible representation of an alternative splicing event. We introduce it into cells, then perturb the cells with the test condition. Then we measure changes in the splicing of the reporter to provide an indication of how the test condition influences splicing. Using reporters introduces some new possibilities. And most importantly for us, uh, splicing reporters can be easily engineered in different ways to aid investigation of splicing regulation. The first way in which we engineered our reporters is for use in luminescence-based assays. We flanked our mini gene with a firefly luciferase open reading frame upstream of the mini gene and a ranilla luciferase open reading frame downstream. We also introduced a stop codon into the alternatively spliced exon and when the reporter is transcribed and spliced in a cell, two isoforms result. A skipping isoform, where both firefly and ranilla are translated and expressed, and an inclusion isoform, where translation halts at the alternative stop codon, and you just see expression of firefly. The ranilla to firefly ratio therefore gives us an estimate of the number of skipping isoforms to the total of skipping and inclusion. We can therefore do really quick measurements of splicing changes across a bunch of different conditions. All we have to do is add substrate to each of our wells, run it through a plate reader, and measure both types of luminescence. And by comparing how the ratio of the Renilla to Firefly changes across different conditions, we can test how these conditions influence splicing. So Jean mentioned earlier, we're interested in RBPs, and specifically we want to do a survey over a large number of RBPs to see how they might influence splicing. MS2 tethering assays work by co-expressing a reporter with the MS2 RNA sequence, alongside a protein of interest fused to the MS2 coat protein, or MCP. The MS2 sequence forms a secondary structure that's bound by MCP with high affinity. By co-expressing these constructs, the protein of interest is brought to a known position where we can measure the effects in that position. In 2012, researchers found that tethering the splicing factor RBFOX1 downstream of an alternatively spliced exon leads to increased inclusion, while tethering it upstream leads to increased skipping. And the tethering approach allows us to measure the effector ability of a protein independent of its binding. So let's say we weren't doing this and we wanted to test hundreds of RBPs. We wouldn't be able to put natural binding sites for all of them into our reporter. So this tethering system allows us to be consistent and test all the different RBPs in a consistent condition. The tethering also allows for detection of these position dependent effects like discovered for RBFOX1, which tend to be really widespread among splicing factors. With these two methods of engineering, we use two reporters for our screen in the end. We use one reporter where we place the MS2 stem loop downstream of our alternatively spliced exon, recruiting RBPs to this position, and another where we put the MS2 stem loop upstream of the alternatively spliced exons, recruiting RBPs upstream. Following the development of these reporters, we tested 718 different RBPs and ended up detecting 58 that activated at least one of the two reporters. Here, we highlight some sanity checks, some known splicing factors whose position dependency matches their known biology, and our unexpected hits, which are these potentially new splicing factors 
And to go into detail how we then characterize some of these unexpected hits, I'll focus on uh, my new favorite protein, tRNA-U1AP. The two main tools we used to investigate our unexpected hits were eClip and Knockdown RNA-seq. eClip is a very powerful technique that our lab pioneered to investigate the binding sites of an RBP. In eClip, we apply UV radiation to create a covalent bond between RBPs and nearby RNAs. We then pull down our RBP with an antibody and sequence the RNA that comes along with it. Understanding the RNA acquired from this method to infer RBP binding is also a computational challenge. And for this analysis, we turn to our lab's recently developed and published Skipper pipeline, which anyone can go play around with at rbp-arc.com. The other technique that we used is knockdown RNA-seq. And here we simply knock down the expression level of our unexpected hits with an shRNA, then measured transcriptome-wide changes in gene expression and splicing. We are specifically looking for knockdown-sensitive exons, or exons whose inclusion level changes in response to the knockdown of our unexpected hits. But the real power of these two approaches comes in their integration. We can find splicing events that change when an RBP is knocked down and have nearby RBP binding sites. This implies that the change in splicing is likely directly regulated by the binding of that RBP. We looked into a few unexpected hits, but the most interesting biology we found was definitely for tRNA-1AP, which is an understudied protein previously characterized for its role in selenocysteine biosynthesis. And following eClip and knockdown RNA-seq, we found over 100 of events with evidence for both binding and splicing modulation in the middle, providing good evidence that this is in fact a new splicing factor. Things also became interesting when we investigated the events on the left, and we had two initial hypotheses for why there are so many knockdown sensitive exons that don't have evidence of tRNA-1AP binding. One is the limited sensitivity of the eclip assay, but another more interesting hypothesis is that tRNA-1AP could be regulating other splicing factors. And to investigate this hypothesis, we looked at the top 10 most differentially expressed splicing-associated proteins. We also looked at the top 10 most differentially spliced splicing-associated proteins after tRNA-1AP knockdown. The strongest change is at PRPF39, altogether implying that tRNA-1AP drives the inclusion of the PRPF39 poison exon and limits its expression level. We need to tie it back to eClip and do the association to get one more piece of the puzzle. An eClip peak nearby this poison exon would give some evidence that the inclusion is actually driven by the binding of tRNA-1AP. So we check the genome track. First here is the knockdown RNA-seq where the poison exon is virtually eliminated upon knockdown, and we see a eclip peak right nearby. So bringing it back to our initial question, are the knockdown sensitive exons driven by TRD1AP's action on PRPF39? We ask this by checking to see if PRPF39 binds these knockdown sensitive exons at a higher rate than the rest of the transcriptome, and we find that it does. Altogether, this lets us build a model where TRNA-U1AP binds downstream of the PRPF39 poison exon which inhibits its expression level, leading to widespread splicing changes. This project also gave us the exciting possibility to collaborate with Marco Jovanovic and Lena Street at Columbia University to perform affinity purification mass spectrometry. In these experiments, we pulled down our unexpected hits as bait proteins, expecting that this would also pull down proteins from the cell in close proximity as prey proteins, which we then identified with mass spec. As splicing regulation occurs through a macromolecular collaboration of many splicing-associated proteins, we'd expect to see proteins associated with splicing enriched in our prey. And to investigate this, we performed AP mass spec with four of our unexpected hits, a positive control, and two negative controls. And when we looked at the splicing-associated proteins that got detected in the overall data set, we see two clusters. We see a cluster with a higher enrichment of splicing-associated preys, and we see a lower enrichment cluster so this provides some positive evidence for tRNA-1AP, SCAF8, and RTCA playing roles in splicing regulation. It's possible that the splicing association and its preys are hidden among a stronger signal driven by its other functions. Our reporters also allowed one more application that I'll briefly touch on, and that's the rapid testing of effector domains in CRISPR-based artificial splicing factors. In these, an RNA targeting Cas enzyme, such as catalytically dead Cas13B, is fused to a splicing effector domain and driven to splicing events with guide RNAs. One thing this technique allows is for the investigation of domains of a protein that drive exon inclusion changes. We can chop up our protein of interest and fuse the different truncations to DCAS13D to see which of them are still able to induce exon inclusion. We found that for tRNA-1AP, the effector domain seems to be contained within the C-terminal domain in these final 111 amino acids. Another application of these CRISPR artificial splicing factors is to modulate targeted alternative splicing events. And we used our reporter to improve a little bit upon the previously published technology. 
And in these previous approaches, uh, researchers fused full-length proteins that are known to influence splicing, like RBFOX1. To compare to that, we tested a bunch of candidates, a bunch of chopped up proteins to find small, more potent effector domains, and ended up developing these artificial splicing factors based on the C-terminal domain of SRSF8 that outperformed the previously published technique. I think this framework is very powerful in being able to elucidate how RNA binding proteins work and many other uh, steps of RNA metabolism. But I think also what's very exciting about, about the work is to the, the ability to get to, at some point, molecular, a molecular description of splicing, right? And, and at the domain level of these uh, potential splicing factors, right? And, and so, so that com in combination with uh, protein structure uh, analyses can help us really define how splicing factors really work. And a really important tangent is that I think these uh, modules can be made smaller and smaller and leverage to uh, modulate splicing in hopefully therapeutic settings.